Well, welcome back to another episode of Classic Krusty. Is there any more Simpsons references that you could spot? Yeah, that's right. We have the former Prime Minister sitting next to the official Simpsons flag, aka the official Australian flag. Thank you very much for pointing that out, <laughs> sir. How have you been? I've been good. I've been rolling around Australia doing good things. You have? Hmm. And you're blurry as well. You're kind of jet lagged hmm. being in the same time zone. That's how much you fly. That's true. But being More than a seagull. Being being, <laughs> being COVID country, I haven't travelled all that much. So you fly from Adelaide to Melbourne to Sydney, back to Brisbane. Yeah, the, you're the very, route, you're, trucker route. You're very confused. <laughs> so, and I find Sydney confusing because you've got more than two lanes of traffic. Mm. Yeah, it is a look. I don't know why they looked at London and thought that's a good idea, but yeah. here we are. It is Sydney public transport, natural grid pattern for laying out the transport system of the largest city in the country. Basically, a bad idea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for criticising your predecessors so much at the beginning of this. They're very good. No, but it goes, it goes back to the beginnings of the rum colony. If you look at the street, the street layout in this town from 1790, it's essentially been completely screwed. It is. It totally is. Every other city makes a lot of sense. Melbourne, Having squares s- like yeah, this. definitely. Adelaide, squares like this. Um, Do you agree with this? Don't you reckon Adelaide is the child of Canberra and Melbourne? I could say many things about that, <laughs> but it's a very tidy town, Adelaide. Yes. And it's very neatly yes. laid out. Colonel Light, who arrived there in, this is a nerdy comment, 1836, he came with a street plan in mind. There was literally nothing there. And if you look at Adelaide, it's perfectly symmetrical, mm. including the green areas which surround the inner city area. It's perfectly encased in green. Here, it's just rolling chaos induced by alcohol poisoning coming out of the rum colony and the fact that people just drank all day. That's what happened. Look, I uh, wish that I could offer a defence for the city that I grew up in, but you've just nailed it. It's just a drunk town. Well, it was, yeah. We we, we call it the rum colony out of affection in the rest of the country. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that that is a compliment here. I forgot about that. Um, The election's coming up. It is. The Adelaide election, so we probably shouldn't have been dumping on them for so much. But, uh, yeah, we'll talk about that later. But there's also the dumping on Adelaide. Look. I think it's a great town. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, you said good things about it. Um, and uh, there's also the federal election. So everyone's dying to know, are you voting for Scott Morrison? I've thought about it a lot. Yeah. I've been to see my priest. Uh, and in the... Secrecy of the confessional, I said at the end of the day that I couldn't vote for Scotty from marketing mm-hmm. because it would be akin to voting for the Antichrist. Mm. So I decided, no, mm. I'm voting Albo. One, two and three. And voting often. Um, you can't change your mind before the day. All right. Uh, you, you, that's it. He's out for you. That's unfortunate. You heard it here first. Uh, That's pretty shocking, I've got to say. Well, if you heard, if you look. Really would have pegged you as a quiet Australian. A very quiet Australian. Yeah. A silent Australian. But I think what the country wants to do with Scotty is that. (laughs) That's your feel of it. Uh, Nice big kick up the bum bum. I think so, yeah. Is that what that is? I thought it was just a couple of mangoes or something. All right. Yeah, sorry. That's, that, yeah, that's right. That's, yeah, we'll keep going with that. I'll let you in on it after we stop filming. Okay, good. Um, yeah, okay. So tell me about it. What do you think Scott Morrison has in his little bag of tricks? Just so you know, by the way, I called him up and Kevin Rudd just rattling off his head. He kind of just freestyled it. He came up with 10 strategies that he thinks Scott Morrison is going to implement that you can play at home with, by the way, kiddies. We're going to start a little bingo card here. Um, we're going to have graphics and everything. Ooh, the future. But in the meantime, can you just give and us- he a- will give you a prize if you win. <laughs> it's very, <laughs> hey, hey, it's Saturday. <laughs> just come in. <laughs> I like it. Bring back the old format. The other one is, uh, yeah. Can Not you 10 just- strategies, 10 dirty tricks. 10 dirty tricks. Hmm. But can you just give us, before we go into that, what do you think- 
he's going to try and do as a quick summary. What do you think his plan is this election? Scrape back in. His plan this election is to talk about anything other than what he's been doing for the last three years, because it is an unreconstructed disaster, both on the pandemic and on the economy and the cost and waste associated with his interventions in the economy. So he doesn't want to talk about the fact that debt is now five times bigger than it was under us, that the deficit is five times bigger than it ever was under us. He doesn't want to talk about anything that goes to the detail of his management of vaccines or quarantine or anything else. So that's all off limits. What he wants to do is to scare the bejesus out of everybody uh, on national security in China, scare the bejesus out of everybody on the future of inflation and interest rates and the cost of living, which he will say will get much, much worse to spooky music, lots of spooky music, Mm -hmm. if Albo and the dreaded socialists get in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's going to be all about national security threats and China, scary music. It'll all be about big spending Labor government under Albo, putting upward pressure on inflation, upward pressure on interest rates, lifting your cost of living, more scary music, more spooky music to make sure that you don't think about anything else, but you're just petrified. Right. So it's his bag of tricks is just the Howard show bag, everything. Mm. And then he's dumping all the lollies on the table in one. That's true. It works. That's true. But the bottom line is just fear and anxiety are the two emotions that always work well for conservatives. Uh-huh. And the reason they make you feel frightened and anxious is because it crowds out any emotional space or mental space to think about hope and opportunity for you, your families, your friends for the future. It's, are you under physical threat from the Chinese arriving on Bondi Beach next Thursday afternoon? Uh, Answer from Dutton, yes, if not Wednesday evening. Uh, And then once once they've arrived on Bondi Beach, your interest rates will go up. (laughs) And both are because of Albo. That's the Liberal Party script. So right. get ready for it. You hear, heard it here on Mr. Friendly's first. Oh, that's... Jesus, you're coming up with all the names. Let's go through this. What was it again? The top 10 big, dirty tricks. That's right. Let's go through number one, shall we? Now that you've given us a nice outline, uh, never mention Morrison's mismanagement of the pandemic. That's true. Delve. It's all bad news, whether you're talking about vaccines, boosters, rats tests... This is the guy who couldn't give a rats about rats. A mm-hmm. uh, bit of poetry there. Did you like that? I did like that a Thank lot, you. actually. Thank you. And, uh, and quarantine. Like, this was all a roll goal disaster, and none of it can be mentioned. So then the subtle psychology of the campaign will be, that's all in the past. And now we've got the sunlit plans extended for the future. But here's the question you've got to ask about this particular dirty trick, which is never mention the pandemic, is given how Morrison handled the last crisis in this country, the pandemic, how will he handle the next crisis in this country, whatever that crisis is? Because it's the same bunch of incompetence running the show. Mm. Especially because this was his second go at yeah. a crisis. He had a practice run. He had the practice run. He put the hose away. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and put back the travel bag from Hawaii uh, and the funny hat and everything. Yeah. And he was really serious this time. <laughs> I'm being really serious about this crisis, except I did nothing. <laughs> okay. I forgot to order the vaccines, bugger that. I forgot to order the boosters, bugger <laughs> that. Quarantine, give it to the states, even though in the Constitution it's a federal responsibility. Uh, but he gee. didn't go on com- on holiday as much, you know? Like, that's right. that yeah. was his improvement. He went on holiday just a bit. Just a bit. That's, that's, he went on a working holiday this fair. time. So that's dirty trick number one. That's dirty trick number Do one. Do not mention the pandemic. It never happened. And number two is never mention the fact and never report on the fact that under our constitutional arrangements, vaccines, quarantine and aged care are 100% 
federal government responsibilities. That's a big one. That's a big one. Dirty trick number two. If you do remember the pandemic, what are these guys actually... <laughs> that old thing. That old thing. <laughs> the P word. The uh, Guess what? It wasn't anything to do with moi. Yeah. It was all because of the states. states. So it's nothing to do with the feds. It's all to do with the states. Mm. Whereas if you actually leaf through the old constitution, that thing we put together in 1901 as the founding legal document of our country, uh, these are all federal responsibilities. Mm. So basically what he doesn't want you to uh, hold him account for is that this was his job to get all these things right and he got them all wrong. That's, that's a classic liberal, even if you're not talking about the pandemic, I've noticed that this is always their go-to whenever they're trying to shift responsibility. That's a state matter. Instantly, shut down, move on to the next question. Well, it's literally, uh, if we're in New South Wales, it's a rugby league state. We play rugby league in Queensland, other parts of Australia, they play other types of football. But everyone knows what a hospital pass is, <clears throat> which is, oh dear, I've got the football, I'm about to be tackled. Uh, oh, <laughs> Have the ball. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, that's the states. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> oh boy, the, st the states got knocked over in the tackle. I'm sad. <laughs> that's exactly what dirty trick number two is all about. Yeah, not me. I was never here. The states. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ne number three. Uh, never mention the fact. You never report on the fact that the reason our public hospitals are under pressure is because Morrison reduced federal funding from the 50-50 split negotiated by the states by the Rudd government to a 40-60 split. Exactly. So if you talk about the pressure on hospitals today, like so many of them have been under the pump with this extra caseload coming out of COVID, uh, in South Australia, where there's a state election at the moment, the number one issue is what they call the ramping crisis, which is all these ambulances ramping outside <clears throat> accident and emergency departments of hospitals trying to get their patients in. And as a result, people are literally dying. But why has all that happened? Because the tap of federal funding to the hospitals of Australia uh, has been uh, not cut off completely, but reduced radically because Morrison, when Dutton was actually health minister, took our agreement with the states, which is a 50-50 a funding cut between both levels of government to provide proper funding for uh, the state hospital system down to 60-40. And that makes a difference of tens of billions of dollars. Jeez. So if you can't get a hospital into an A&E, accident emergency department uh, at a hospital, it's because they don't have the money. And why have they not got the money? State outlays on hospitals, both Liberal and Labor states, has been going up. Federal outlay to uh, hospitals has been going down in real terms when measured against the agreement that I did with them in 2010. Why do you think they did that? Because they frankly think that hospitals ultimately should be a private health system. That's why they don't like Medicare, because Medicare is about the public funding of your visits to the GP. They'd like to get rid of that as well. But rather than taking it on head on, because that would be politically honest, what they do behind the scenes is that they pull out the funding from Medicare bit by bit, pull out the funding from the states for the public hospital system so that the kind of the, uh, the sign is still hanging out the front, swinging in the breeze with rusty nails going through it. Medicare here, mm. public hospital there. Mm. So we haven't actually abolished them. Mm. We've just defunded them mm. until the signs drop off. And so... Because they want to reduce yeah. taxes overall, and they think everyone should look after their own uh, health through private health insurance, private hospitals, private doctors, an Americanized health scheme. That's actually what they want. But the, the long-term strategy is to make public hospitals so bad that people are kind of begging for private hospitals. Is yeah. that the deal? Yeah, they want to it's so evil. take the pressure off tax, which, which means reduce company tax and tax for the wealthiest Australians. And the way you do that is to reduce the most expensive outlays uh, for the federal government, which is hospitals in large part, together with Social Security, which reduces the tax burden on people like Murdoch, 
for example. So they go cheer, 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 cheer. <laughs> um, that's great. People die in the hospitals. Who cares? Yeah. Um, because not my problem. You yeah. should be privately insured. You're poor. You're unemployed. Your that's problem, you. sucker. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then secondly, yes, everyone gets sick, but you should be wealthy enough and successful in life enough to provide for your own private health insurance. That's actually what it's about. So when you see hospitals, uh, ambulances ramping at hospitals, what the Libs definitely don't want you to conclude is that, that ultimately is a federal responsibility. Dutton as health minister and then ScoMo when he was treasurer engineered this revision of the Commonwealth State Hospitals Agreement to take down the total federal allocation of the hospitals. Where do you see all that in reality? When an ambulance parked outside your local hospital at Bankstown, whatever, can't uh, get their patient in because there's not enough beds. Perfect timing during COVID, eh? Hmm. Number four, uh, never mention the fact and never report on the fact that under Morrison, total federal government debt and budget deficit is now five times what it was under you. Hmm. It got us into debt in the first place. Are you sorry about that yet, mate? <laughs> Not at all. Because yours, and I just need to bump in and defend you for a second because I don't think I do that enough. I think I'm probably the toughest person in Australia on you. But um, I would have to just say the reason that you got us into debt was for long-term investment things, not even just preventing us from the GFC, but also nation-building projects, whether it be renewables or just, uh, you know, repairing schools, things like this. This is basic infrastructural costs that most of your stuff went into and obviously, you know, just spouting money and so the economy ticked over. But when it came to their debt, you're obviously much more qualified on this. But their debt did not go into building the country. Not at all. Their debt was signing a whole bunch of checks to people like Jerry Harvey who didn't need it. Uh, the, you've got 40 to $45 billion being uh, uh, provided to private companies in Australia who never experienced a cash flow problem, uh, whose bottom line was not really hit by the COVID-induced recession. But because they're all uh, friends of the Liberal Party, uh, we're all given an unconditional check. Uh, so as a result, if you look at this total massive outlay through a combination of a job keeper and, uh, and a job, the other jobs program, I can't remember the name of it now, you add it all up, you are looking at in excess of $100 billion of Commonwealth outlays and not a skerrick to show for it afterwards. Yeah. Other than a bunch of money in the back pocket of a bunch of folks who didn't need it. Mm. So back in the global financial crisis, uh, where every economy in the world went into recession, we avoided it by immediately stimulating the economy. Um, we did that in part by doing things like building uh, thousands of libraries in primary schools around the country. Mm. We did it by a whole bunch of other construction projects, such as the uh, uh, dual carriageway on the Pacific Highway from Sydney to Brisbane. Uh, Projects like that, which are of enduring benefit to the nation, but also generate ec economic activity, generated jobs, kept things turning over. None of that. If I was to ask your viewing audience here on Friendly Geordies, uh, brought to you by MGM Productions, name for me one thing that you can point at today that is a physical legacy of this 100 to $200 billion dollars of your money and mine mm. flush down the S-bend mm. of the, the national financial sewer system, which is what they did, I challenge someone to tell me one thing that they can point to as a legacy. We have 3,000 libraries, 3,000 school um, uh, perf performing performance centres. We have roads, rail, ports, infrastructure, NBN, right around the country. For a fifth of the price. Hmm. So, and that they have just spent like drunken sailors. So dirty trick number four in this series is don't mention the fact that their debt is five times the size of our debt. Secondly, despite spending five times as much, they didn't keep us out of recession like we did. And thirdly, they don't have a single thing 
today to show for it. And all wasted. I've got to say the other thing. Isn't it phenomenal that the reason that you had to go, that Labor was just too rotten to stay in government, was because of a fifth of the debt that we're currently in. I don't think that I've ever seen the Murdoch press mentioned once. No. <laughs> like five times the amount of debt. Uh, and if you look back to the 2013 election campaign, the one I uh, was defeated by Abbott in, the bottom line is every ad on television was debt and deficit, mm. spooky music, mm. black and red, debt and deficit. <laughs> well, you should have was scary. five times as much red and five times as much black and five times as much spooky music. <laughs> I don't know if they can. It's impossible. <laughs> pretty big words. <laughs> <laughs> and just let it go for five and a half weeks of the campaign. Don't turn it off. That's the proportional response yeah. in the spirit of independent journalism uh, and reporting. That should be the case today. But it won't be. That's why it's dirty trick number four. Uh, number five, having distracted the nation towards the total national security framing for the election, then divide the nation on China, challenge by pretending that an incoming Labor government would be soft on China. You've done great work on pointing out that. Lie about the previous Labor government's record on standing up to China on defence, foreign investment and human rights. And lie about your own record flogging off the port of Darwin to Beijing for 100 years. And that is not the only asset that they have sold to the Chinese, by the way. They've sold a few. We've got a whole video about it. But yes, you've got a video as well about it. Both of us are into videos. Yeah. That's yeah, right. you're basically a YouTuber these days. <laughs> yeah. the, um, but on this one, and you're going to hear a lot about it. Uh, during this election campaign, dirty trick number five, which is national security. Spooky music, debt and deficits. Spooky music, national security. Spookier music, China and national security. Yeah. And then the whole... Bit of mandolin in it. And the whole subtext is, the whole subtext is Albo Manchurian candidate. Yes. Whatever that is. Um, mandarin candidate. Yeah. yeah. And uh, whereas the reality, the truth is uh, somewhat more complex. A, Albo was senior cabinet minister in my government when we brought down a defence white paper doubling the Australian submarine fleet in order to deal with the emerging China challenge. Uh, B, our government, with Albo as a senior cabinet minister within it, uh, signed a new agreement with the Obama administration to bring in thousands of extra marines into Darwin uh, together with the pre-positioning of their equipment to deal with changing military circumstances in our region. And then C, who flogged the port of Darwin to the Chinese? Mm. Uh, it was the Liberals. Mm. And not only the Liberals, Scotty from Marketing was the Treasurer who ticked it off. And the then, yeah. Liberal, the then Liberal Trade Minister, Andrew Robb, resigned one day and then the next day starts working for the Chinese corporation for a mozza that bought the Port of Darwin for a hundred years. Can you imagine if a Labor government or a Labor Prime Minister sold the Port of Darwin to China for a hundred on a hundred year lease? We'd be shot the next morning with rusty bullets. Okay. This mob just say, it's business. It's business. No problem. Bob's your uncle. Okay. Move on. Move on, not yeah, a problem. Nothing. So dirty trick number five. China, national security, spooky music, labor, elbow, brrr, don't mention the Port of Darwin. That's incredible. The, un the other thing that I will say about it is more than anything, I think this really shows that these people have no principles. They pretend to have principles when it's convenient for them and then they change them immediately when it isn't. But you see them kind of just taking the side of China or the US, depending on whether it benefits them personally. Whereas with you guys, there was a consistent yeah, we're position always... there all the time. It was kind of just like, no, we'll call out this behavior, but we also understand that we need to have good relations. We need to have a balanced and... relationship with China, understand where the real problems, challenges and threats lie, act on them, uh, and still ensure that um, we can do business with the People's Republic of China 
and not take out a megaphone every second Thursday morning and pronounce the incoming arrival of 19 platoons of Chinese commandos on Bondi <laughs> Beach with Dutto down there, our very own Benito, uh, <laughs> Benito Dutton, down there with his hard hat on, ready to defend us. <laughs> That's kind of the script here. It's the script. <laughs> and it's just so much unreconstructed bullshit. Final point on this. Do you remember the whole debate about this Chinese company called Huawei? Now, Huawei Vague, yeah. is a uh, Chinese telecommunications company. And uh, our government refused Huawei permission to install hardware uh, into the national broadband network because of security concerns. Um, the incoming Liberal government thought long and hard about overturning that decision. Uh, but who goes on to the Huawei board to earn a mozza? Uh, Alexander Downer, the previous Liberal no. Foreign Minister of Australia. No. Yeah, 100 big ones a year. Uh, but that's business. That's okay. Uh, you see, the whole thing just reeks of hypocrisy. Mm. Their whole attitude mm. to the China relationship literally has been cha-ching, you know, mm. rake in the money, okay, and then have the audacity to turn around and say that the Labor Party has somehow not been robust on the China relationship. I remember Julie Bishop, the then Liberal Foreign Minister, attacking me for raising human rights concerns with the Chinese over the Uyghurs in Xinjiang. And for giving a visa to a visiting uh, Uyghur dissident who'd come to Australia to give a speech. She said, I shouldn't offend the Chinese. I remember that your video did highlight this, but I, it's so strange how I just, just the human mind does do that. It's just like, you know, this is on the television now, so this is reality. But hmm. you raising that video, I remember a time during the Howard government well, that was their consistent line. Hmm. Just shut up about it. Don't say anything. That was... was no, very much so. Kind of I, I got attitude a, of fear and just change. I got attacked from one end of the country to the other, led by the Murdoch media, led by the Liberal Party, saying I should not upset the Chinese by raising human rights concerns. Yeah. And so, and today, they are seeking to say that a Labor Party would somehow be weak on China. Pig's ass. Hmm. 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 Because the difference is the Labor Party governs in the national interest while they govern in self-interest. Well, we Put try to get shirt, it, kids. We, we, we try to get it right. Yes. Dirty, <laughs> yes, dirty yes, trick number six. Dirty trick number six. Uh, having distracted the voting public away from the mismanagement of the pandemic, hospitals, aged care, debt and deficit into a fabricated national security divide and depicting the Labor Party as weak, they launch an ugly personalised attack on Albo to try and delegitimise him as the alternative prime minister. Hmm. That's, that's what, very naughty. That's, that's what they do. <laughs> Murdoch's single interest, like the Liberal Party, is to delegitimise any leader of the Labor Party. Hmm. Look at, if you're in Victoria, look at what they do to dictator Dan, okay? Uh, uh, if you look at Queensland, every day in the Murdoch Monopoly newspapers, it's Anastasia's most recent crime against humanity. Uh, uh, Look at their treatment of uh, the West Australian Labor Premier. Mm. It's as if he's um, somehow, you know, strangled his state completely. Um, Perrottet, a hero mm. of the people, um, and whoever the guy is who's Premier of South Australia, I can never remember his name. Nice, yeah, he nice can. man. Yeah, Mr. And it's such a forgettable name as well, it's, Stephen Marshall. It's Mr. Met. Yeah. That's, <laughs> Stephen. Short, Stephen, short for Marshall. Stephen, yeah. Stephen Met. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> sure, he's a nice fellow. I don't know. I've got no idea. But these guys can yeah. do no wrong. Um, but you look at the vicious personal attacks against the other uh, Labor premiers. It, that's how they do it. The whole objective politically in the Murdoch-Morrison enterprise is to use, uh, is to personally delegitimise through character assassination the credibility of Labor leaders. They've done it in the past with me, with Gillard, prior to us. And they did it also with Shorten, prior to us. They also did it with Keating and, um, and, and with Hawke. People have forgotten that, but back in the day, that's what they did as well. And so that's because Murdoch and the Liberals do not want uh, 
credible leaders of the alternative government or of the uh, current government of Australia to remain in office because yeah. it's inconvenient for their business interests. What's so, the get, so get ready for the smear campaign against Albert. Well, what do you think they're going to go for with him? What character are they going to build out of Albert? Oh, look, the, the, if I was going to predict the Liberal Party campaign at a more generic level, it'll be you can't trust Albo on national security, China, spooky music. You can't trust Albo on debt and deficit, impact on inflation, impact on interest rates, cost of living, more spooky music. And uh, Albo is, um, uh, is um, not a family man because um, he's um, uh, like half of uh, the rest of Australia, he's divorced. And Morrison is not. So I reckon under the radar, they'll try and have a go at him on that sort of stuff. I suppose that is what they are positioning him with. If you looked at the 60 Minutes little fluff piece that they did on Scott Morrison, that's you know, they've got the so. shots with the family and everything like that. And then you've got hmm. Albo, and you're right. That's what I know about his personal life. He's had a divorce. That's and that's true. obviously like seeping through to the conscious. Yeah. Like half the country. Yeah. So, um, and also, you know what I so, find? So I can't put a name on it what the... Dirty Tricks campaign will be against Albo personally, but I know from my own experience that uh, either above the radar or below the above the horizon, or below the horizon, um, through um, below the radar tactics, uh, they will be going after him personally. They always do. Mm, definitely, uh, I will say that it is quite interesting that I have seen in the papers more this kind of thing of like, yeah, Albo seems like a really nice guy, which I think might be a positive thing in that they're struggling to find something to hit him with, but it moves into he's a nice guy, but can he handle the government? Can he handle China? Yeah. But at least they have to say that about it. That's him. true. So the, uh, the framing you hear from the Liberals every day is, yeah, Albo is a nice enough bloke, He's yep. a nice bloke. Yeah. Pause, but. <laughs> <laughs> He's an axe murderer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Looks can be deceiving. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's all being set up to do. Because the last thing they want to have with Albo is a policy debate about the future of the country. Future of, of health, future of education, future of climate change action, anything that really matters for the country's future. Why? Because they'll lose it. Therefore, you delegitimize someone's character. Mm. And that's what they're on about. Done it in the past. They'll do it in the future. They'll do it to him this time. Yeah. Uh, number seven, lie to the voting public that Albo would be a risk to the economy. Well, that's the liberal classic. Yeah, yeah. As we just uh, just discussed, the um, they look at Albo and they'll say, "Can you trust this man with running a uh, two trillion dollar plus economy?" Spooky music, spooky music, spooky music. That's what they'll do. Whereas the reality is, Albo, senior minister in my government. The Minister for Infrastructure for six years, delivering $75 billion worth of complex infrastructure projects across the country, major roads, rail, ports, other building programs. The challenge to the Liberals is this, find one of those projects that actually went wrong. Find one. Like, And you're talking about dodginess as well. I, either wrong in terms of any ethics yeah. or wrong in terms of waste, mm. wrong in terms of corruption. Mm. And these guys are um, buried in corruption, uh, the current Liberal National Party government. Like, it's a cesspit of corruption. Did it's you a, see the rankings recently? Under you, I think the rankings were we were the seventh least corrupt country on earth? It was certainly yeah, in that range of five to seven in, the, in that period. And now I think we're... 18, 19? 18, yeah. Like we're down with Slovenia or something, you know. We dropped as many positions as you had us at. Again. In a year, in mm. one year. And it's not just car park rorts. It's not just um, sports rorts. Uh, these are what I describe as retail rorts. It's the industrial scale rorts and the, the industrial scale corruption of how the tendering system has been managed on very large scale government tenders. There's something quite rotten in the state of Denmark here, mm. and it's not Denmark, it's Australia. Mm. Mm. So, um, so therefore, they're going to run this uh, extraordinarily hypocritical campaign. You can't trust Albert to run the economy. 
$75 billion worth of infrastructure investments. He's the responsible minister. Not one accusation of impropriety on any single project and not one of them with any report from an Auditor General saying there was an overspend. What's the problem? What's the, what is the, pro- what's the what problem? What is the problem? I mean, I regard that as a reasonable report card. <laughs> Given that delivering a massive project like doubling the Pacific Highway, for example, here to Sydney, is full of complexity. Uh, the, rail, the, uh, the rail project, uh, which goes from Melbourne out towards Geelong, it's a $3.2 billion project. Lots of stuff can go wrong with that. Mm. The Redcliffe Rail Link in Brisbane, uh, which had been promised by successive state governments for 100 years. We actually built it. I took the decision. He gave it effect. Not a problem. Done. Yeah. Finished. Yeah. Uh, on budget, on time. Light rail on the Gold Coast. We don't even have a seat on the Gold Coast. It's the reverse of car park roads. It's an area where we don't actually have a single seat, nor any real prospect of winning a federal seat. Yeah, reverse but pork barrelling. It's reverse pork barrelling because <laughs> there the traffic system was appalling and you had to take uh, pressure off the main drag in the Gold Coast. Mm. That was something like a $650 million project. Mm. Delivered on time and on budget. So two ways. First of all, it shows how ethical you guys are, but it also shows that the Liberal Party can't even pork barrel right. No, exactly. You're just building a bunch of like women's bathrooms or something for the ovals instead of building something like the light rail. I would love to see the final numbers on the quantum of pork barrelling that we don't yet know about from this government. Remember, they are constantly under-resourcing the uh, Auditor General's department. Yes. Um, And the reason they're doing that is it's the only scrutiny agency left given their uh, politicisation and undermining of the independence of the public service. Well, this actually, just as a quick side note, if I may, I don't know your opinion on this. Do you think that the public service is a good thing? I do think the public service is a good thing. Well, that's shocking. There's two bombshells in this already. Um, but <laughs> so I, used to, I used to be a public servant. I was, a, I was in the Department of Foreign Affairs. I was a professional diplomat. And then uh, where we had it drummed into us, this is in the days of the bloody Fraser government back in the Mesolithic period, mm. okay, mm. Uh, when you weren't even thought of, mm. um, when uh, we were told public servants advise, ministers decide, and if you have a problem with the ethics of a ministerial decision, you resign. Mm. That's the ethos that we were brought up in. Mm. And so our job was to serve honestly and effectively the democratically elected government of the day and for there to be a professional, independent public service who could serve any incoming government to implement its democratically endorsed program in an election. Mm. That's gone out the door. This mob have just taken the Australian public service and like integrity in general, flushed it down the S-Bend with five times the deficit as well. Boom. Five times the deficit. But that's what I'm scared about. It's, I, from what I've been, talk, I've been talking to a few people in the public service and they're kind of just saying the damage that they've done in the last 10 years is sort of irreversible at this point. A lot of the public service has been privatised. A lot of the public service, like you just have all of this institutional memory that's just been completely wiped that you're never going to get back. If Labor is re- elected at this uh, upcoming election and I hope and believe they will, the need for what I would describe as a long-term Labor government to repair the essential institutions of the Commonwealth uh, is fundamental. Rebuilding the public service, entrenching its independence in legislation, restaffing it with people who are professionals, preventing the future politicisation of it, it's a long-term task. It's doable. But if we don't, we're not going to be just number 19 on the International Transparency Index uh, in terms of our level of corruption. But we'll be out there with the, with the Russian oligarchs. I mean, it's that yeah, bad. Yeah, I think so. It's I that think... bad over time. Because you have experience from this back in the Bjorki Peterson days, right? Like, you can't expect miracles and you can't expect that level of damage to be repaired overnight. It's going to take terms, hmm. terms, just to get back to baseline. Yeah, so terms. really, that's what's going to happen with the incoming Labor government. They're, as the Liberals are always saying, they're going to have to clean up Liberals' mess. Yeah, exactly. That's the, the uh, whole point. You see, politics matters because it's the way you bring about sustainable change. And you've got to clean up the institutions of government and the integrity of the public service, which is critical the integrity of our public tendering process, which is doubly critical because it's tens of billions of dollars, uh, then you need time to do it. But unless we get the politics of this right by changing the government, 
then the rot starts to become a cancer. Mm. The cancer ultimately kills you. Mm. Scary stuff. Uh, eight, why did the voting public that Albo would be weak on China despite having the same cabinet? Well, we've kind of done dirty decisions. trick number eight already. Yeah, wait, so there's nine dirty tricks, actually. Mm. Yeah, you're gone, number eight. Uh, well, number nine. It's the China dirty trick. Mm. Just look at it for again because they're going to do it a lot, I mm. guess. Uh, nine. Run a below the radar spear campaign to delegitimize Albo personally because fifty percent of the country. Oh, then the divorce. Okay, but we just we've done, we've done dirty trick number nine. <laughs> dirty eight. Isn't there a Quentin Tarantino film song? Anyway, that's the one. Um, number ten. The great giant sleeper Murdoch ranks in the money for months of Clive's. Front page ads, and I will say that this is really interesting that in the last election, they did treat Clive Palmer as an enemy, if I remember correctly. And now they've realized, no, he's a really useful asset because it seems like Clive Palmer has just honed in on that. And I really do think that this is a cultural vote. There's no way that you can convince these people because a big part of my channel constantly is just pointing out your record and then pointing out the Liberals ever since, you know? Mm. Best managed economy on earth, worst in the developed world. This is just, we have the figures, down the line stuff, but you will always get the response, they're the same, they're both scum. And I think that what Clyde Palmer has done ingeniously is just keep pushing that narrative and then move those votes into the Liberal Party with preferences. That's exactly the case. Dirty trick number 10 is the Clive Palmer dirty trick. Yes. In cahoots with Murdoch and in cahoots with Morrison. So you've seen so far this massive um, uh, yellow and um, uh, black and gold advertising campaign across the country on behalf of Parters, Palmer's United Australia Party, whatever it's called. It does look cheap for someone with so much money, doesn't it? It does. But, um, but what's the ambition here? The ambition's pretty simple. Uh, it's... For three to six months prior to the election campaign, appear to be a pox on both their houses. Mm -hmm. It's about the Liberals and it's about Labor. Then mysteriously, as we get towards the election itself, <laughs> one of those poxes disappears. Okay, We've only got a half pox. And, and guess who the half pox is? It's the Labor Party. Oh, uh, damn. Oh, Jeez, surprise, again. surprise. Oh, Maybe next time, guys. And, you know? and this time, doubly surprising is that Murdoch's on the team. Why? Because Palmer has been out there buying Murdoch through the massive uh, purchase of front page advertising in the Murdoch uh, print newspapers for the last at least six months. The amount of money this guy would have spent on advertising on front pages alone is in excess, I think, of probably what Murdoch has earned through Jerry Harvey's uh, Harvey Norman ads over the same period of time. So suddenly Murdoch, ever principled, <laughs> that uh, Rupert and Lockton are always principled, <laughs> deeply committed to the principles of liberalism, yep. say, cha-ching, <laughs> there's <laughs> Uncle liberal, Clive, yeah. <laughs> checks come in the mail, Bob's your uncle, Clive's your uncle. Uh, and uh, no, not a problem here. But most critically, he's now on the team. It's Team Palmer, Team Murdoch, Team Morrison, because what I predict will happen is two things. Murdoch will not provide any coverage at all for Palmer being a stalking horse for the Liberal National Party in this election campaign. And secondly, as we get down to voting day, mysteriously, through an act of God, it could well turn out that Palmer's how to vote cards in every seat that matters mysteriously preference the Liberal Party or the National Party ahead of the Labor Party. Mm. And if he's picked up 10% of the vote on the way through, having bought $17 squillion worth of advertising space in the country, and you've got a Palmer vote of 5 to 10%, between, depending on where the seat is and in which state and what part of the state, that gets corralled through the compulsory preferential voting system and Palmer's how to vote cards on the day back into the Liberal pile. That's the sleeper, and that is... Dirty trick number 10. It's a big one. We got there. Slash eight. Slash Whichever eight. number we Because we have two with. repeats. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Now, Slash. whatever. 10's a better number. Look, there was 10 there. You got it. You got a long video today. Stop your whining. 
Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Mr. Rudd, on your uh, truck driver route from Brisbane to Adelaide to Melbourne to Sydney over and over again at Infinity. That's good. Thank you very much, Mr. Friendly. And, um, and to anyone who's watching, give long and deep reflection to the 10 Dirty Tricks. Friendly has already indicated that he'll give out a prize each day of the campaign for those of you who come up with the best example of Dirty Trick 1 through Dirty Trick 10. I and finally... I was under the impression that you were going to do that, but uh, no. okay, yep, I'll, I'll, I'll bear that cost. Yep, I'll give no. the prize. The multimedia magnate will look after that. <laughs> thanks, thanks, okay. thanks, yeah, but yeah. But the most important just thing... just what I need, more expenses. More yep. important thing for <laughs> yeah. each and every one of you to do is to give Scotty <laughs> from marketing the arse. <laughs> That's beautiful. Thank you so much for your time, sir. Uh, bonus footage as well. And this is great because it is in exact proportion to how important state elections are to the federal elections by <laughs> coverage because we've got like a couple of minutes here to just chuck it at the end. You've been to South Australia, as you mentioned at the top of this. And well, you've seen Stephen Meh in action. I've seen Stephen Meh, uh, who was the Premier of South Australia. Trace and I went down there. And um, she's a South Australian, my wife. So we had a few days off, but we we're also doing some campaigning. State election coming up, less than two weeks. You've got Stephen Meh, the Liberal Premier, and you've got the Labor guy, Peter Malinowskis, Captain Sixpack. And uh, <laughs> seriously, you should, you, should, you, should, you should see this guy's stuff. <laughs> Like I said to Albert, I got to see it. Does anyone have him? I got, yeah, show us, show us. Is it that impressive? Does he look like one of those men's health guys? Uh, on top of that, yeah, A cubed. Yeah. So I said to Albert the other day, he's obviously modelled his campaign on you and me, mate. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, clearly. And because uh, I've been working on my six pack for the last twenty years, and it's kind of not gone anywhere. Jesus Christ. No, that's Peter Malinowskis, not Jesus. In my eyes. Uh, oh, my God, what? And perfectly tanned as well. <laughs> that's great, isn't it? He's like one of those 20s bodybuilders, you know, with like the circular. He's got that body. It's pretty impressive. How can you not elect that man? He, that should be his slogan, too handsome not to be premier. Well, I'll, li I'll, leave, I'll leave that one with you. But I spent some time with him the other day. He's 42 years old. He's sharp as a tack. Uh, as you know, he's almost as fit as you and I. And, uh, and I think he'd be a great uh, leader for the great state of South Australia. Yeah. And if all else fails, just do the Arnold Schwarzenegger thing. Just keep talking about how you used to be a professional bodybuilder. It'd be enough to get you over the line. I think so. Sorry, I wasn't even thinking about the other. That was, yeah, I'm fixed by that. Peter Malinowskis. Please share and comment below. Command.